Hey y'all, here I am again. <laughs> Same outfit with the book of Acts. Um, but this time we're going into chapter 21. And whenever I read this chapter, it really um, sparked my interest into reading more about prophecy. And how do you know when somebody's prophesying or prophet line? What's false? What's true? Um, I did some research and I'll share just a little bit with you. But I always want to encourage you that anytime you've got questions about anything, um, always search for the Word of God, search for the truths, search for any of the commentaries or anything that you find online, make sure they're able to back it up scripturally as well. Um, so we're going to be hearing about some prophecy in, in, this, um, in this chapter as well. And then I've got some notes that I want to make sure that I share with you from my study Bible. So it's not a lot of Stephanie notes. It's a lot of true biblical commentary notes. So let's get busy on Acts chapter 21. All right. After saying farewell to the Ephesian leader, we sailed straight to the island of Kos. The next day, we reached Rhodes and then went to Patera. There, we boarded a ship sailing for Thess Thessonicia. We sighted a I didn't evidently do the pronunciation like I did on the last chapter. I'm just going with it. Here we go. We sighted the island of Cyprus, passed it on our left, and landed at the harbor of Tyre in Syri Syria, where the ship was unloaded its cargo. We went ashore, found the local believers, and stayed with them for a week. These believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go to Jerusalem. Remember in chapter 21, he was like, um, the Spirit is telling me to go to Jerusalem. Back in verse 22 of chapter 20, uh, it says, now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me except the Holy Spirit tells me then in the city after city that jail and suffering lies ahead. He knew that suffering was lying ahead, but he's doing God's will. So here we go. So, believers, they prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go. When we returned to the ship at the end of the week, the entire congregation, including women and children, left the city and came down to the shore with us. There, we knelt, prayed, and said our farewells. Then, we went aboard and returned home. So, here, what I read about and was studying was there was danger awaiting for Paul in Jerusalem. Now, when those other people said that they were prophesying, they were almost like a feeling part of it. Um, they, they, they did get the sense that he, there was going to be danger, but it was more or less they were warning him. They were warning him as, and as if don't go. But um, Paul was like, I, I got to go because I got to keep the glory of God in mind. So, they were wanting to prepare him, but he knew. All right. Verse 7. The next stop after leaving, Tyre and um, Petolemaeus. No clue how to say that. Where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed for one day. The next day, we went to Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip the Evangelist. One of the seven men who had been chosen to distribute food. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. So nobody's disagreeing with this at all. But remember, they sometimes some people, like in these earlier verses, were trying to warn him and then didn't want him to go, but he knew that he had to go and he knew what was coming ahead. Several days later, a man named Abagus, Agabus, who also had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. He came over, took Paul's belt, and bound his unfeaten hands with it. So he's given like a kinesthetic learning little lesson here. Then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul, don't go on to Jerusalem. But he said, why all this weeping? You are breaking my heart. I am ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but to even die for the Lord's sake of Jesus Christ. 
When it was clear that they couldn't persuade him, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. Verse 15. So all of this right here, let me see if there's something I want to share. After reading verses 1 through 14, I said, while researching prophecy and the difference between true and false prophets, and then specific commentary on this point of Acts, this is what it said, and it cited um, is from Chambers cited in Hughes. I'm not even sure what website I've got this from. I just wrote it down. Quote, unquote, to choose to suffer, to choose to suffer means that there's something wrong. To choose God's will, even if it means suffering, is a very different thing. No healthy saint ever chooses suffering. He chooses God's will as Jesus did, whether it means suffering or not. So, and that's what, even in chapter 20, when I talked about um, Paul's feeling what Jesus went through because Jesus knew what was to come. Paul knows what is to come. He knows he could even die. Jesus knew that he was going to die. He didn't want to go the way he did. Paul doesn't want to go the way he did. But if it's God's will and it's to bring glory to God in the end, that's why they did this. Because even Jesus said, take this cup from me if it be your will. But it wasn't. It had to be done and it was done for you and me. All right, here we go. Now verse 15. After this, we packed our things and left for Jerusalem. Some believers from Caesarea accompanied us, and they took us to the home of Manasson, a man originally from Cyprus, and one of the early believers. When we arrived, the brothers and sisters of Jerusalem welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went with us to meet with James, and all the elders in Jerusalem went, um, Jerusalem church were present. After greeting them, Paul gave a detailed account of the things God had accomplished among the Gentiles through his ministry. So, even then, you know, he's given glory to God. These things happen because of God through Paul. Paul was an instrument. And that's what I say. I just want to be an instrument for God. I just want him to speak to me and just speak through me. Um... To him be all the glory. Verse 20. After hearing this, they praised God. And then they said, You know, dear brother, how many thousands of Jews have also believed? And they all follow the law of Moses very seriously. But the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem, they have been told that you're teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn their backs on the law of Moses. They've heard that you teach them not to circumcise their children or follow other Jewish customs. What should we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. Here's what we want you to do. We have four men here who have completed their vow. Go with them to the temple and join them in the purification ceremony, paying for them to have their heads spiritually ritually shaved. Then everyone will know that the rumors are all false and that you yourself observe the Jewish laws. As for the Gentile believers, they should do what we already told them in the letter. They should abstain from eating the food offered to idols, from consuming the blood of the meat of the strangled animals, and, and from sexual immorality. So they're refreshing our memory in that last part. Remember um, back in some chapter, whenever they were... Um, Chapter 15, whenever they were um, doing a compromise and um, keeping, keeping the purpose for God, but knowing that sometimes you've just got to step up and go a little extra mile, even if it has to, you got to show a little tradition to let people know that you're really for them, not against them. Well, here's what I underlined in my Bible commentary in the study notes. It says, although Paul was a man of strong conviction, he was willing to compromise on non-essential points. Non-essential points. Remember, the main points about repenting and, and turning to God and, and 
in having faith in Jesus Christ, those are essential. That's not going to be compromised. But compromise on non-essential points, becoming all these things to all the people so that they may have, um, that they may save some. We should remain firm on Christian essentials, but flexible on non-essentials. Of course, no one should violate his or her true convictions, but sometimes we need to honor Christ by mutual submission for the sake of the good news. Here it continues. The Jewish laws can be taught of in two ways. Paul rejected one way and accepted the other. One, Paul rejected the idea that the Old Testament laws bring salvation to those who keep them. Salvation is freely given by God's gracious act. We receive salvation through faith. Okay, again, it's not about the religion. It's not about the traditions. All of those are good to um, non-essential way to respect, but that's not what saves someone. Only the grace of God. The laws are of no value for salvation except to show us our sin. Two, Paul accepted the view of the Old Testament laws, prepare for and teach about the coming of Jesus Christ. Christ fulfilled the laws and released us from this burden of guilt. But the law still teaches many valuable principles and provides guidelines for grateful living. Paul was not observing the laws in order to be saved. He was simply keeping the laws as customs to avoid offending those which he wished to reach with the good news. All right, verse 26. So Paul went to the temple the next day with the other men, and they had already started the purification ritual. So he publicly announced the date when their vows would end and the sacrifices would be offered for each of them. The seven days were almost ended when the some of the Jews of the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple and roused a mob against him. They grabbed him, yelling, Men of Israel, help us! This is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and tells everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. He speaks against the temple and even defiles the holy place and bring in the Gentiles. But yet, we just read that he didn't. He's compromising. They need to get their act together. They need, to, they need the whole story. Verse 29. For earlier that day, they had seen him in the city with Trophimus, a Gentile from Ephesus, and they assumed Paul had taken him into the temple. Verse 30. The whole city was rocked by these accusations, and a great riot followed. Paul, he was grabbed, he was dragged out of the temple, and immediately the gates were closed behind him. As they were trying to kill him, Word reached the commander of the Roman regiment, and all of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately called out the soldiers and the officers and ran down among the crowd. When the mob saw the commander and the troops coming, they stopped beating Paul. So here he's grabbed, he's dragged, he's trying to be killed, they've beaten. Sound familiar? Sounds like what they've come done to Jesus earlier. Verse 33, then the commander arrested him and ordered him bound with two chains. Remember the prophets? prophecy earlier, that's what they said was going to happen. He asked the crowd who he was was and what he had done, which I'm amazed by that. Don't they know who Paul is? Even before he was Paul, when he was Saul and what all he had done, has, I don't know, did he change his appearance that much? I don't know, just, just thinking out loud here. Um, I thought everybody would kind of know him, just like everybody should know Jesus, right? Let's see. Some shouted one thing and another shouted another. Since he, he couldn't find out the truth in an uproar and confusion, he ordered that Paul be taken to his fortress. As Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent, the soldiers had to lift him to their shoulders to protect him, and the crowd followed behind him shouting, Kill him! Kill him! All that kind of sound familiar? Verse 37, and almost done because there's only 40 verses. As Paul was taken, was about to be taken inside, he said to the commander, y'all, now think about this. 
He has been beaten and dragged and whipped, all the stuff. But he's like, oh, hang on, I got something to say. And so he's not finished yet. It, it's, he's got that boldness. He's got the Holy Spirit within him. May I have a word with you? Do you know Greek? The commander asked, surprised. Aren't you the Egyptian who led the rebellion some time ago and took 4,000 members of the assassins to out, um, assassin, assassin? out into the desert? Uh, no, replied Paul. I am a Jew and a citizen of Taurus in Cilicia, which is an important city. Please let me talk to these people. So again, these people didn't know everything, the truth that was being said about Paul and about even what he was saying. If you're going to speak something, get your facts straight. Don't gossip. Don't spread lies. Um, don't say things that aren't true. And some things you just don't even need to say in the first place. Lock it away. All right. Just Mama Shove talking. Here we go. Please let me talk to these people. The commander agreed, so Paul stood on the stairs and motioned to the people to be quiet. Soon, a deep silence enveloped the crowd, and he addressed them in their own language, Aramaic. And in the next, next chapter, 22, we're going to hear what Paul spoke to them. So, I hope you will join me and, um, and make sure that you... Uh, Stay reading God's Word and growing. Take care. Bye.